This is awful. Yo, why is it so blurry? You have a nice model. Show it to me. What's up, animators? Sharp here, and welcome to Gear, a series where you send me your 3D work and I give my expert art reviews. So I do 3D production professionally, and I thought this would be a fun video idea. So if this video does well, there's a submission link for part two in the description. So just click it, fill the form, and you might be in part two if this video does well. Otherwise, I'm not making it. So we got everything out of the way. So like, subscribe, and enjoy the show. First submissions of video, and I need headphones. So if you remember these, you're the real OG. This is a super old inside joke with the ears and everything. I still have them. Let's take a look at the first submission. Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. One is more deserving of a rest and all the effort in the world. Okay, so first thing I'd comment on here is the mouth. I think the biggest setback here is the lip sync. The lighting is okay, the rig obviously looks like it's well made, except maybe the pinching on the hair here. It's little things. But for the most part, it's the mouth. Lip syncing is tricky because not only do you have to match the shape of the mouth as it's saying it, but certain things are pronounced more. So when your character is saying something silent, you wouldn't open your mouth half as much as you would here. If you take a listen to this again. Not that I wish to imply you have been sleep. He's speaking in a calm and quiet tone, but he's speaking like this. The mouth opens up a lot and makes a lot of gestures. People talk a lot about, you know, conversational motion. If someone is excited, they're gonna move a lot and jump around. And if they're calm, their body's gonna reflect that, obviously. But the same goes for the mouth as well. How's it going, guys? This is just an example, so you can see my mouth. And how it changes when I switch my tone. I feel like it also needs like some frowning and smiling on the edges here, because it's always just kind of rectangular almost. The mouth is a complicated part of the body, and even though this is a Minecraft character, our brains still expect a similar sort of expression from it. Maybe some effects are a little bit overboard, but this is stylization, so it's very subjective. Definitely I would say improve the motion, but apart from that, nice job. Next up, we've got this render. You can really tell that I come from a Minecraft background. So this is apparently made in Blender, and I have three main comments for this. Number one, of course, you have floating blocks up here, you should avoid that. And if this is made with Blender, this is a part of the mesh, and you can just select it and delete it, so it's not an issue. Number two, something that happens a lot in these renders, the lack of ground here and the hole that also reveals the void behind it. This makes the world feel very small, limited, you know, like it's floating somewhere in the void. Now imagine if you added like some ground here with some far mountains in the background, that makes it more wide and open and actually believable, right? Those two are pretty obvious. But the most important thing to mention here, I think, is the lighting in the sky. It seems like you're going for an overcast lighting type, but the sky image you're using just feels really blurred, right? You could get this with renders as a result from, you know, the aperture and depth of field, but at this distance, the mountains should already be affected by it. So this feels like you used an improper texture for it. I would say go to polyhaven.com, find an overcast HDRI. They have plenty of those. Or you could also go to Google and just type overcast sky texture and you can find a lot of stuff there. And for the lighting, even though it's an overcast sky, you still have light patches in the clouds, which should result in an actual light source coming from there, right? Your lights are coming from left and right, even though we can clearly see a light behind it, you would expect some shadow here, maybe a rim light on the arms. There's also some sunlight coming from the right, so the, the light is kind of all over the place here. I would say replace the sky. If you use it as an environment texture, this is Blender, it will take the light from the image and use that as an actual light source, so it should be accurate to what it is. And then on top of that, I would still add some sunlight from one direction, make the sun angle very big so it's very smooth, so there is an overall light direction which kind of breaks the image apart a little bit. It's not accurate, but it looks better. Okay, we're moving away from Minecraft. I was sent a Blender file. So this is a project file that I'm going to review. Okay, so number one, organize your freaking collections. What is this? You get an F, you fail. This is the resulting render, of course. And for this render, I have nothing to say, except maybe composition-wise, top right part is a little bit empty. I would try to extend some lights or patterns or streaks or something here. Not a big deal. Lighting is good, rig looks well made. Textures have variation, which I really like, because people don't usually do that. I don't like the rigs where the pole vector affects how the wrist is turning. You get an F there. See? Like on the feet, you did this on the feet. Or maybe you want it this way, I don't know. What I find very interesting is that you put a light source inside the mouth. That's actually big brain, and you can see it on the render as well. So you get reflections in here, little rim light on the teeth. That's good stuff. A lot of people when making a 3D scene, they think they have to position physically correct, accurate lighting and stuff. 
That's not the case. That's how you start to learn the rules, but when you know the rules, you know how to break them. There's no realistic way for a light to be floating inside his mouth, but it clearly adds to the image here. So oftentimes in 3D scenes, you would find lights in places they have no place to be, but it makes the image look better because you just want the highlight here. And you get the highlight by cheating actual light. So this is something I love to see. You actually composited this cone here. <laughs> That's kind of funny, not gonna lie. Next up we have this, and it feels like a collage of different animations. Okay, so instantly what I love about this is the tempo. A lot of beginner animators stick to very slow, controlled movements, and it makes sense, of course. But if you look at this, you have fast swooshes, and I feel like in between, the character even squashes and stretches, which is one of the principles of animation that makes it more appealing. It's obviously very stylized, not realistic, but that gives it the extra appeal. The face is expressive. When watching animations, we always pay attention to the face, because humans are social creatures, and our faces convey emotions, so we've just biologically learned to pay attention to them. You can rewind this video, watch my face, it's always been moving, so it's been doing something, because that's what faces do. And when you incorporate this into your animation, the faces are very dynamic dynamic, very expressive, that plays a role in it. Third factor is his body language, because his body is also gesturing all sorts of things. People don't do it in real life, but animations, who, who? You know, it's like a choreography of sorts. Fourth part is the environment. You have a neutral key light here on his face to illuminate the character, but it's placed in like a green ambient background. So the fill light here is gonna be green to blend them into this environment better. Don't really have anything to say about this. This is good stuff, keep it up, nice job. Cube goes to heaven, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. This is... This is art. Okay, so I have a few things to say here. Space is very dark, with limited light sources. So when you're doing space light, you want to have only one sunlight, ambient colors, completely black, a lot of contrast. So that's one. I'm actually bothered by the asteroids. The cube is funny, no comment, love the idea. Second comment comes here. I love the refraction you did here. The black holes actually warp light so much, you can actually see the back of your head if you're standing there. What's missing is some texture on the accretion disk. Texture, animation, this should be spinning like, like a flaming ball of plasma, right? It needs some texture, it needs some movement. Then again, this is a little bit of a silly video as well, so. You know, good job. <laughs> okay, next up we have this. It's a desktop background, and I feel like its biggest enemy is the lighting. So this is obviously supposed to be an epic battle scene, right? So the lighting should kind of support that. Whenever you have intense emotion, action, battle, uh, anger, death, whatever, the image needs contrast to really bring that out, right? So in a fight situation like this, I would dim the light above a lot, so these blades on the character are one of the main light sources, because that would give you like a nice rim light effect around the character, right? So this guy would have like a nice rim around the body. The middle of the body would be almost pitch black, which would look badass as hell. This feels like a simulation world of some sorts. So if that's what you're going for, I'd make this material here, like the lines here, blue, emissive. So it feels like something out of Tron or something. And the last thing I do here with this blood splatter, I would add blood particles in the air with a refractive material so they would catch the highlights of these. So every blood speckle in the air would catch a glimpse of this light. But you know, the rig is nice, very low poly, but it kind of fits the style here, video game battle. I like it, this is good. Okay, so we have this render and also a solid preview. This looks very nice. I like it. There's actually a lot of attention to detail here. Did you have to make every single asset or were you allowed to borrow stuff? Because that's, that's a lot of detail. If you did everything by yourself, congratulations, that's dedication. You've got all these props here, like this space feels like it's been lived in, right? You have cups here placed in a circle, with some cups inside the other ones, there's a lamp, there's guns on the wall. It's very full of stuff, which looks nice. Uh, there's, a, there's a cigar here. Lots of little details like that really bring the scene together. Even sticky notes, that's dedication. Plus, obviously, the lighting. You have lines from the blinds here. This is completely off camera, but it gives an effect on the image. You notice it right away. There's nothing I can say about this. I think this image is perfect. I'm just appreciating all the work that went into this. This is nice. I really like this. Okay, next up, we have three renders from the same person. I think lighting could make this better. What I'm getting here is that it's flying over the ocean. This is like one of the waves reflecting the orange sun. The owl should be covered in orange. 
We're in the middle of the sea. The sun is the only light source, right? I'll get rid of this light on its face or at least dim it down a lot. So it's just there enough that you can see. And I would crank this light behind the owl a lot. It's very orange as we see from the water. And it could be a great opportunity to just crank up the subsurface scattering. Subsurface scattering is a material property which lets light pass through the material and it picks up some of the color from the object. That's what makes skin feel like skin. And in things like this, it could be very nice. So I would crank this sun so much that the wings almost start glowing from the light, right? The subsurface scattering is piercing through it. And this light here on the face, I would either get rid of it or dim it down just enough so you can see the silhouette. Depends on what the sun would look like. Guys, hey, hey guys. Monkey. This is very abstract and simplistic, the pinnacle of modern art. Da Vinci himself wishes he could achieve something like this in his lifetime, but there is one issue with the young artist and its texture resolution. The monkeys have no texture, that's fine, but if you're going to use texture, don't, don't do this. I don't like this. This feels like stucco on the walls, but the balls are this big and the texture resolution is just pixels. So you have to cover a big area with a texture which is pretty much repeatable. Uh, in this case, I would not use image textures at all because quite quickly you can run into stuff like this. If you have a tileable texture, you can just scale it up a lot, but then you have repeating patterns. Even though the texture is not really tiling, you can sort of see that it's repeating itself. So in this case, I would actually make a procedural texture, a procedural noise texture. And for the most part, that should take care of it. You could also go the extra mile by adding the ambient occlusion node, mixing that in with a different material to have like gunk and dirt in the crevices and stuff like that. There's a lot you can do here, but I like this abstract composition and the lines and stuff. Good idea. I tried to open this file, but you didn't link your texture. So I have to watch this purple blob now. Actually, I'll do this. Never mind. Okay, so this is a rig. The most important thing about a rig is the controls. Are they easy to use? Do they do everything you need them to do? So let's see. This is the main controller. It works with scale. That's good. Uh, one problem here is that you should apply the mirror modifier because if I move one leg, they both move. That's obviously not what you want to have on a rig. So I guess this is like a linked rig. Is this uh, bone constraints? How does that work? Work. If I move this one, it's the same. So it's not it's not a mirror. Anyway, moving on. So this bone does not let me rotate or move anything. If I scale it though, it works for the scale. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Ah, shoulder blades. This is nice. I like this. It's a good thing to have. You do this with all of them. It's a nice rig, by the way, like the nice model. And of course, you know, with the IK handles, it's not gonna mess them up. That's that's actually good. Ooh. This is the head and here I would say the pivot point is all the way up here. That's not ideal. You would want the head to rotate somewhere from this point here. So it could go both up and down, left and right, because now the pivot point is all the way up here. The head is somewhat going to make wonky movements. I'm pretty sure this shouldn't be moving. The controls are pretty bare bone. If I were to use this, I would expect some next level controls such as foot rolls, IK, FK switches, because if this thing stands up, you now have to manually animate the IKs and stuff. The wings are a little confusing to operate and the weight painting here is going on the belly. It's little things like this, but overall it's nicely organized, it's color coordinated, so this is all just a big plus. Yo, is this real? Hold on. That is some good stuff. When it comes to faces, faces are the most difficult thing you can do in 3D. First you have hard surface modeling, then you have hard surfaces with curves, organic stuff, animals, living creatures. But on the top of that list, it's faces. Because like I've mentioned before, humans are social creatures. We recognize faces very well. And here, just seeing facial proportions, they work very well. It also helps that this guy is an alien. Some of the proportions can be off and it's gonna be okay. Ears don't grow up here, but this is an alien, so it makes sense. Okay, so this is the original. If you take a look at this, it's not quite there, it's more rounded, but I got pretty damn close. You even got variations here. So this is obviously pretty damn good as it is, but I'm here to tell you how to improve things. So if there's anything I would do, probably try adding little pores on the skin, little micro details, but definitely overall try to get the proportions even closer to the original. You see a lot of sharper angles here, the cheekbones, the piece of fat here we have as humans. I feel like yours is also more vertical, the original feels more horizontally stretched, but that's all something that comes with time. You did, the, you did this better than I could. Okay, next up we have a fighting scene. This is a good learning opportunity here. Let's see. I'm gonna do something, give me a second. Okay. 
Fighting is one of the most complex forms of motion you can animate, because it requires your undivided attention on several different places at once. So first of all, you have gravity, then center of mass, choreography, human behavior. If you take a look at this here, I'm gonna nitpick you a lot. I'm just gonna pick it apart because it feels like there's a lot to uncover what's going on here. We have character A and character B. So first we see a lack of reaction here. So character B feels like he's waiting on his turn. He's just got his arm here. Then the reaction from character B is like, huh. <laughs> Realistically what should happen, it throws him off balance, which requires him to make a step back because the center of mass has now crossed his contact point with the floor, and also the punch here would, you know, throw him around much more. So it feels like the impacts are not strong enough here. The kick here feels nice, it actually has a proper impact, and I like the roll in the end, but it feels like a very safe fight. It feels like you're avoiding too much action in order not to have to animate the legs and stuff. A lot of times it helps if you stand up and act it out. So when you punch, you go down because you want extra force. So when you're punching up, like the first guy did, so you want extra force from the legs, so you do this. When you punch, you also transfer force forwards. You're still going forwards and you want to stop yourself. That's why you get the second punch in, because you can push yourself off and get, get your balance back. And the other guy, character B, he gets pushed back, he has to step down with his other leg to stop himself because he's keeping a balance. Then he gets punched in the face, so it's like one, Two, he's already leaning back. My center point of mass is right here. If I move to the side and it crosses the contact point of the ground, I'm gonna start to fall over, right? You need to react with your legs to keep your center of mass in between the contact points. And then the kick would have just flipped them over completely. What's missing, I think, is just reaction, center point of mass, but also just human behavior in general. This guy's just looking at him in his eyes like they're lovers. Realistically, you'd be, you'd be looking at your opponent's, you know, limbs to see where the punch is gonna come from. I get it, fights are hard. Oh no, oh no, it's a Maya render. I have bad experience with Maya. The worst part is this actually looks good. How dare you make something good using Maya? You are banned from gear. I also like this, you gave me individual passes here. That's cool. Okay, it feels like a, a nightclub of some sorts. And I really love the diverse and playful lighting here. You have blues, you have magentas, you have yellows. I like how the stairs are nicely illuminated. You can feel the shape of every object in the scene. And at the same time, it works very well with the scene. So lighting, no comment. Lighting is done very well. Good job. What does bother me a little bit maybe is the textures. Obviously this chunk of rock here makes no sense, but also the ground here either feels like random noise or it's very, very, very gunky floor. Like they had a bar fight and a thousand alcohol bottles got smashed here and this is just the aftermath when everything is dried up. It's all sticky and weird. And little details, something people don't usually pay attention to, but it's texture scale. So if this is a nightclub, you would expect a, an average person to be around this big. So this is a somewhat big sign, right? But the corrosion and rust on this metal is very big. If you look at this sign by itself, isolate it without context of the scene, because of the size of the corrosion and stuff, looks about this big. But when you scale it up, that corrosion would be so much smaller, it had finer little details and stuff. So texture scale is something I would change here. So to summarize, lighting, amazing. Good job, Mwah. love it. Texturing, a little bit on the nose. Okay, we got some CinemaScope. Ooh. Why is it so blurry? I can't see anything. You have a nice model. Show it to me. I wanna see it. Jokes aside, the blur is way too much. I, th I think I can find like three or four frames when it's actually in focus, plus the motion blur on top of that. It's hard to see anything what's going on, but it feels like the metal is way too saturated. The blue is just shining through. Makes it kind of feel fake like a little plastic toy. I would definitely take some of the saturation away and the normal map you have on these textures feels very strong. So these little bumps here, if this robot was as tall as my house, as is implied, these little bumps would be like this big right and because of that because they feel so big your brain forces you to see it like this is very small like this is a tiny little toy right this is regular surface imperfections this is a good example this bottle opener so you can see it has surface imperfections but compared to my finger they're very very small now compare these bumps here they are enormous so naturally your brain thinks that this is just a very close-up shot of something miniature right because of the size of the surface imperfections 
yeah, even here on the leg, it's very prominent. On the plus side, motion design, it's very fluid. It always runs smoothly. That's a nice thing to see. It's got interesting focus points. You see the arm, you see the light, you see the leg. There's always something small to focus on, so that's a very good thing. But seriously, drop the blur. Imagine being a CG artist, spending like 70 hours making a nice mecha suit model, and then the compositor just blurs everything because you, that's why. Next, we have a sculptor. And oh boy, this looks very nice, hold on. Okay, so that's a hair dryer. This is very good. I love the topology, I love the edge flow, even this bit. Like, it's made of two different objects, and there doesn't seem to be any normal artifacts or anything. This feels like a professional model. But something with this video as a whole feels off. And I think it's because it can't decide whether or not it's a commercial or a cinematic piece. So if this was a commercial, I would tone down the depth of field. You want to see the product. But this is blurring it too much, so the handle is already being blurred. That's not going to fly in a commercial. You want to see as much of the model as possible. Make it bright, happy, shiny. When people see this hair dryer, they want to feel happy. You will like my hair dryer. And if this is a cinematic piece, then it's missing some surface imperfections, you know, some, some fingerprints. I hope you can see it. Smudges, you know what I mean. But the model itself, love it. Second piece, and I think the only thing I would say here is probably the mesh resolution. The model is nice, it has a lot of little details, but what threw me off are these imperfections on the edges, right? If you imagine getting this as a physical model, you would expect like factory perfect surfaces and whatnot. It's very prominent here on the logo, even here on the jeans and on the cape. I think this comes from mesh resolution because that's usually the type of artifacts you get. So if I were you, I would work in a higher resolution to avoid stuff like this. The sculpt itself is good, no comment, good job. And then it's this masterpiece which I simply adore. There's nothing to say about this except it's great. There's a few things I like about this is number one, the cloth makes this very dynamic. It kind of guides your eye around the character so you see all these little details. Number two, character proportions. The proportions are realistic. And third of all, something that I can express a lot of gratitude towards is the patterns. There is so many levels of detail here that just keep on going. For example, like there's clear dividers where the pattern changes. It's not like you just plop the pattern on it like I did in one of my old projects. This is awful. This is cringe. You can tell I was in a rush, but here you can see intention. You can tell a lot of attention has been put into every individual part of the model. It is noticeable. You didn't do this for nothing. This is nice. I like this. Next we have this, which is from Warhammer, I believe. It's a game-ready character. 25,000 vertices. You got all of this detail in only 25k vertices. That's optimization. You can see how this is done. The polygons are used so sparingly and so intentionally that I just had to applaud you. Except maybe one thing that I would say is the cape here could use an extra level of subdivision. Just add some loop cuts on every edge here. Because I've also noticed up here, when the character makes poses, you can sort of see this low poly stuff. If you added a loop cut on this, it wouldn't add that much to the whole poly count, but it would make the cape a lot better. So in that case, it would be worth it doing it that way. Also, good job on the bake. This is a complete box, but the texture bake just smooths it out completely. This is, this is nice. Even the textures are crafted very nicely. Stylized for sure, but also done really well. Next we have this doorway in the middle of a forest. And here's what I'll say about it. I think all the foliage is good. You have variation, so there's grass, there's these tall plants, and there's also these little yellow dots. All these tall plants don't look identical, so it feels like it's all natural. The trees are nice, they fit well, and also in the background, the silhouette. It's barely noticeable, but it gives a sense of environment here. So foliage-wise, it's all good. I think what could use some work is the door. Let's go through why. The issue number one would be just the topology itself. This has a lot of crooked edges. On the other side, we have this. It feels like the geometry is clipping itself because this edge down here is aligned with this edge and it feels like this edge just crosses that inverted clip geometry. Th this feels wrong. Then there's also a part of it missing, but there's lines coming out of it, which just looks like stretched polygons that forgot to be deleted. It feels like sloppy mesh cleanup. I'm not sure if, if it's intentional, if this door's supposed to look like a glitch, but to me, looking at this render as a whole, it doesn't feel intentional. Then the second thing is these 
squares here. I'm aware that this is probably just the design of the door, but it doesn't fit on the door. I would expect like a certain frame or something to make it look like these squares are integrated into this because currently it just feels like they're pasted on top. Maybe some patterns or an intrusion or just something to signify that this was placed there intentionally. So this is like a part of the door design. Uh, but the other solution would just be to get rid of these bark uh, stuff and try to make a pattern with the door itself. And the third one, which is very important, is the texture. You have the diffuse, you have the displacement, you have the roughness. That's what makes a PBR texture, that's all good. But what separates good art from the uncanny art is the context. Right here, we have a door in the middle of the forest. And if you saw this in real life, you would expect to see dirt. Let's take a look at some of the objects that were left in the forest. Quite quickly, they get overgrown with moss. There's a lot of dirt, rust. There's gunk starting to form, maybe fungi. This door was just placed there. It doesn't feel like it's actually a part of the scene. That's what I mean. Overall, it's a good idea, but this door, just this damn door, man. What is this? Okay, so what this feels like, if I guess how this was done, the teddy bear feels like it was AI generated. This is an actual photo of you, I'm assuming. And this castle, I guess, is a 3D model that you've made. So you've placed the mid-journey photo in the background, you've made this castle, and then you put your cutout here, and this is just a camera pan between all three. I'm not sure how to feel about this, because this is obviously a mix of different styles. So you have realism with mid-journey, then you have cutout with yourself, and then the castle itself, it feels miniature for some reason. I'm not sure why. Oh, the camera is moving pretty fast. I think it's a combination of a shallow depth of field, because in real life, the further away you focus, the wider the depth of field is gonna be. The focus point is on you. This should be somewhat focused as well. And then the fast camera motion, about the speed it would take if this was a miniature castle. But then the lighting as well, because it's lit from multiple directions, which would only be possible on a small set. I'm not sure if this is something you made in a 3D software, or if this is like some web service that does this. You throw at things and you pick a template. It feels like one of those things. Also nitpick time, the UVs here are offset. If this is not a template, if you made these, just move the UVs, man. But yeah, that is it for gear. This was gear episode one. I hope this was educational. We saw some very nice things in there. Much approval. Mwah. And if you like this video, if it does well, I'll make part two. Click the link, submit your stuff, and the next time I do it, you might be featured. With that being said, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next episode where I give my expert art reviews. Bye-bye.